I joined this chorus of admiration for Borgen. And maybe if I was to symbolize the TTIP, the three-day negotiations between the US and Europe, it would be to com a comparison between House of Cards and Borgen. And uh, you can see who wins. <laughs> the starting points are different. The methods are different. And nobody yet knows the results. So as the minister was saying, this is not the end of culture. It's a net, not the death of anything. But it will be a fight. And I do think that we should also listen to the critics. But maybe I will be looking at, at the TTIP from the point of view of the European Parliament. And like the minister said, it's in the final end, the parliament that will approve of any agreement. So therefore, maybe a parliamentary view is a, is a good one. Just to give you an indication of how dynamic and maybe challenging, unexpected the relationship between the European Parliament and the trade negotiations are, I was with the Foreign Affairs Committee in Washington last October at a time when the NSA was listening to Angela Merkel's telephone. And there were actually probably a majority of the parliamentarians who actually European parliamentarians who called for cancellations or at least delays in the negotiations so that the data protection questions could be solved before any trade negotiations would go further. The negotiations are going further, the data protection is not solved, but it shows you the sensitiveness of the issues. I'll try to bring you a little bit closer to uh, trade negotiations and culture as you know, there are no final results, but I can see the legal framework and the frameworks that surrounding the negotiations in terms of your expertise. But before I do that, I would like to say a few words about economy, since economy is, is the question that is most on the table, and also a few words of transparency, since this is one of the basic problems in the negotiations. First of all, uh, these negotiations are about trade, they are about trade liberalization, and they are about tariffs. And so usually gains are expected in terms of free trade, in terms of, of more wel welfare, in terms of increased GDP, and even in some cases in, in case of increased employment. It's very difficult to estimate this now, and, and, and the supporters have these very, very optimistic views about uh, how the European crisis will be solved. And, uh, and the uh, opponents have, on the other hand, very pessimistic views on, on what the scope is. But just to give you an idea, the most, uh, most optimistic views are that um, the trade the liberalization of trade between the US and Europe will give every family 500 more years, euros per year. And the pessimistic view, this case coming from the global uh, public trade watch, is that it will only give 40 euros per family a year. So the, this, is, this is for you the scope. The tariffs are already low, and, and the advantages in trade will probably come through regulations and, and standards rather than by actually lowering the already low tariffs. Seen from the European perspective, uh, there are some people who say that this TTIP will give us a chance to make the reforms we need anyhow using the TTIP as an as, um, excuse. On, on the other hand, so there may be some positive consequences for cohesion within the EU. But there will be very great differences between the member countries, who gains and who loses. Germany is supposed to gain. They have a lot of trade with the US. France is the obvious loser. They have very little trade with the, with the US. And so there will be also differences in, in sectors. The mobile vehicle sector is the one that is expected to gain most, and agriculture will be a difficult point. Consumer and environmental protection is one that we all fear in Europe will be lowered, lowered through the 
the discussion about the standards. On the other hand, it's very interesting to note that the Americans argue that their labor protection is much better than the Europeans, and that they, therefore this will reduce their labor standards. So the situation is not so uh, unidimensional. And, and uh, it is also a question that, uh, for example, the US administration, Obama, will need a trade promotion authority from Congress, which he doesn't yet have. So it's not uh, easy to predict what will be the, the situation. Also, there is this fight between the Republicans and, and the Democrats. We know there will be elections, and uh, the Americans are not, the Republicans are not interested in giving Obama some kind of a, a success story before the elections. So this is maybe the economic situation is undecided. We don't know. The supporters talk about gains in the economy, and the opposition is about social protection, environmental protection, and so forth. I think the one question that is a very sensitive one for us in Europe, and especially in the European Parliament, is the question of transparency. The mandate, as it is now, is not publicly available. Uh, the European Parliament members, who actually will be the ones accepting uh, or rejecting the agreements have not are not receiving the actual texts of negotiations. There is an advisory council where some of civil um, society members are, are also participating, but they don't receive the texts either. So there is this question of, of transparency. I think my message to all of you would be that, uh, that uh, we, we have to require this transparency, that it's very important to have it. And I think on top of you all, the Trade Commissioner right now, not the future, and De Cooked, has also a favorite project in TTIP, in these negotiations and after, that there should be a regulatory cooperative council between the EU and the US, consisting of administrators and uh, business representatives who would preview any coming legislation, who would have the ideas what to do. And, and this would be a completely closed forum. So <clears throat> the problem is that the business interests may gain in, in power. So I really welcome this meeting, and I hope that, that uh, this will increase the transparency. Now to the actual question of cultural, cultural question in the European Parliament and in these negotiations. I think the key concept is cultural uh, diversity. The European Union is committed to cultural diversity. This is one of the preconditions for the Union. And this also applies to trade agreements. There's a point in the functioning of EU treaty that states that the Union shall take cultural aspects into account in its actions under the provision of the treaties in order to respect and to promote the diversity of its cultures. So there is a basis. So, and this, of course, also applies to the TTIP. The problem is that in trade there is no de clear definition of culture. I know you all know that there is no clear definition of culture, but in the, in the general trade agreement on services, the so-called GATS, now you don't have to leave the room, this is about services and trade, actually uh, culture is uh, combined with recreation and sports. So you have this trade agreement with recreation, sports and culture, and there are subsectors called entertainment, press, libraries, sporting, and other recreational facilities. Culture is in there, and the question is that all agreements have to be approved by GATS since that's uh, part of the WTO and agreements, and EU has signed on them. So uh, the question is that, that uh, these uh, definitions don't cover everything about culture. But, uh, and I think the classification problem will be one of, of critical aspects within the TTIP negotiations. On the other hand, this agreement does not prevent dealing with culture in a different way. 
And this is what is called the cultural ex exception, the idea that culture can be dealt with differently than other sectors. But there is no legal status for this within the EU for this exemption. So the EU refers only to the concept of promotion of cultural diversity. And as I said, this may be it's open for negotiations. Sometimes the negotiations will be talking about creative industries. This is actually the instrumentalization of culture and uh, excluding all creative industries will be probably very difficult since they include a lot of factors. And creative industries are also um, possibility to measure the impact on GDP and, em and employment. So what is the situation now in relation to the cultural exception? The minister has already commented on it. The US is interested in coming to the European film and TV market. And uh, France has especially been against this and already in GUT in uh, 1993 did receive an exception. The European Parliament in May uh, last year actually voted on a resolution saying that cultural and audiovisual services should be exempt from the negotiations. Now the Council approved only audiovisual services. So you will have this uh, fight or discussion of audiovisual services only or other cultural services as well. And uh, of course, the Council has approved, it is in the mandate that the audiovisual services are exempt from the, from the negotiations. And the Commission is not allowed to negotiate any provisions that would grant access to European markets for the U US companies. But, uh, and it's also required that in, in the preamble of the TTIP, it will state that the agreement is based on EU values, consistent with the principles of EU foreign policy, and takes measures to promote cultural diversity according to the UNESCO Convention. But the US has not signed this convention. There is also a sort of a loophole saying <clears throat> that maybe at a later date, the audiovisual services will still come into the negotiations. How could this be possible? There's two things. One is that there are a lot of people who argue, like the minister was also mentioning, <clears throat> that it is, uh, it is a good idea that everything is discussed, even if, uh, even if uh, the result would be that they are, uh, they are not affected. And uh, there are others who say that sensitive issues should not be taken out of the discussions the US has already asked that banking be exempt from the discussions. So if it turns out that the treaty will lose its sensitive content, there will be a lot of arguments that also the audiovisual services, as well as other sensitivity sectors, will have to be included. The second aspect is that if the negotiations are sort of coming to a deadlock, then of course, there will have to be some compromises and maybe the audiovisual services will, will come under this. The other part of the European uh, Parliament's resolution about excluding cultural and audiovisual services was that the European Parliament support strong um, agreements on intellectual property rights. And this is, I think, in important. Everybody supports copyrights and, and, and this uh, basically should be part of the negotiations, although it was not self-evident. There were people who were arguing that also the intellectual property rights should be excluded. Basically because there are very different views. The pharmaceutical industry in the US wants to have patents what, which are strong. On the other hand, the internet uh, services would rather prefer that the copyright and the intellectual property rights were not part of the discussions. There's also a question that the Europeans have these geographical indicators for some products such as feta cheese, 
and the Americans are claiming that these are common words and that these geographical exceptions have to be, have to be ex deleted. So there are disagreements on the uh, IPR sector. I would here like to refer to the ACTA agreement that was rejected by the parliament and actually, I think it, it illustrates some of the differences between a US approach and a European approach. The parliament disagreed with ACTA and rejected it because it considered the freedom of expression to be of important, an important quality and that there was a conflict in this, in ACTA. This was not about uh, piratism because these are regulated by the nation states in the EU. On the other hand, the, the, the US is more concerned about property rights, and so there's this balance, like in the question of data protection, also in, in the question of internet, uh, uh, excuse me, intellectual property rights. It may be that the ACTA will emerge again in the context of the TTIP. Uh, there are some indications that this might happen, that it, it will be at least uh, brought in once more. We'll have to see. And, and work in it. In view of conclusions, and how many minutes do I have? A couple. Okay. Okay, let me just point to some of the long term and short term conclusions. I think uh, you sh we should accept that the European Parliament and, and Europe is divided on, on the question of the TTIP. There are supporters who argue on economic grounds and op opponents who argue on protective grounds, and both probably e exaggerate. I think the main problem in this context, and this is uh, one of the conclusions, is the question of secrecy, and this should be removed. But in, in terms of the TTIP, uh, there are some concrete things. First of all, I, I think it's a paradox that um, when we talk about cultural diversity, we have, to, we have to protect them, we have to exempt them from uh, negotiations. On the other hand, the situation is such that this is necessary. In, in the ideal world where we are not, this will not be necessary, of course, but given the situation where we are facing the multinational US companies, this is a fact of life and has to be taken care of. So I think the exemption of audiovisual services as well as cultural services should be uh, uh, maintained. The second conclusion is that the positive aspect of all this is that culture has a critical uh, view. Culture is actually brought into these negotiations in a way it has never been before. So it's seen as cultural diversity is actually uh, discussed, it's debated, and I think this should, we should acknowledge that this is a chance to carry a discussion about culture in the European Union that extends the, um, across the borders of the TTIP and actually to increase the policies, do better policies, more resources for culture in the EU. If you look at the situation today, and this is the joke that is always given in the parliament, that the culture is supported by the EU with the same, same amount as, as tobacco growing in the EU. So it gives you the dimension. And this is not an adequate uh, comparison. We should compare culture with the technological and innovative uh, research programs such as Horizon 2020, and actually claim that in addition to European research space, we also need a European cultural space. And I think third general conclusion is on the creative industries, that it's a problematic. Culture has a value of its own. Cultural diversity is not only about creative industries. So we should not have this reductionist approach that culture becomes creative industries in negotiations. Finally, on the long term, I would, I would like to, and this is an appeal to you sitting here, is that uh, I think we should watch out that the audiovisual services are not taken into the mandate. That actually your European organizations, lobby groups in the artists and cultural fields are strong enough and well organized enough to maintain this cultural expression, uh, exception. And the 
second is that there is a need to introduce better participatory practices. And here I think the artists and cultural um, uh, people should work with the NGOs and actually pressure for greater transparency, for creating greater uh, dialogue on the questions of, of this uh, trade agreement. And finally, I'm looking for these discussions here. I, I hope that we together can find some openings where the demon is not strengthened and, and where actually we can find a more balanced and constructive view and actually have an impact. Thank you.